Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, and it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX design and product management professionals. My guest today is Andrew Tokely, or Tokes as he prefers to be called. As one of New Zealand's most respected independent product leadership coaches, advisors, and community builders, Tokes is on a mission to raise the awareness and practice of product leadership throughout the country. Through his coaching and advisory practice, Tokes helps successful established businesses and those that have more recently found product market fit to build high performance product leadership teams. And he's got the track record to deliver on that promise. Back in 2009, Tokes joined Xero, the cloud based accounting platform, as their first product manager. Over the next six years, he went on to scale the product team from 20 people in a single office to over 400 people across six offices in four countries. Before starting his coaching practice in 2017 and after leaving Xero, Tokes took on the roles of VP of Engineering and then Global Head of Product at 8i, a promising New Zealand startup that is building hologram technologies for the emerging AR and VR markets. Tokes is a generous pioneer of and contributor to product culture in New Zealand. He is the founder of the country's first product tank meetup, which he still coordinates and that now has over 1,000 members. Recently, he became the operating partner responsible for product at Movac, one of New Zealand's most successful venture capital firms. And he is the moderator of the product stream of Kiss My SaaS, a forum for senior leaders of SaaS companies to improve their knowledge and capabilities through peer-to-peer -peer learning. Described by his clients as refreshing, strategic, and someone who really makes a difference, I'm very much looking forward to today's conversation. Tokes, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Brennan. It's good to be here. I I'm super proud of the product tank that I started in Wellington, and I just have to call you out. There's actually uh, 2,000, over 2,000 members now, uh, not 1,000, so twice as good. Um, and, uh, <laughs> yes, and that's it. Well, I'm really proud of where we've taken that. I love it. Even better than I had thought. That's, I know, uh, right? that's amazing. <laughs> and we're competing with Auckland, so I always compare the number to Auckland, right? They've got, and they, I don't know what the population difference between Wellington and Auckland is. It's probably six times bigger or something that would say that, but they're only twice as big as us in the <laughs> numbers. So uh, there's a little silent sort of competition going on there, which is fun. Well, I'll make sure that Anthony Martin knows about the uh, competition oh, yeah. if he doesn't already. <laughs> He'll know. Hey, it's great to have you here. And as my listeners know, I often like to kick these conversations off on a serious note. Your Twitter bio says that you're a travel loving tree hugger and a one time banana picker. Please explain. Yeah, I don't use Twitter very often, but that's still accurate and true. Um, I, I guess I, I do have a bit of a tree hugger in me. I like, I love the outdoors. Um, I. Um, I like to protect it by doing some trapping for a local group of possums and um, and all the other predators around there. Um, the banana picking thing is really a um, – I, I left New Zealand after university to go on our what we call our OE, overseas experience, right? I don't know if mm -hmm. I heard as much anymore, but it, certainly when I was going through university, it was the expected thing to do. So I was imagining taking a year off – um, doing a bit of traveling and um, it took me it took me six months before I even got to London I went through Asia uh, and just loved it and then I was away for three years and during that time I did lots of different jobs uh, mm -hmm. and one of them was working on a kibbutz in Israel and I um, uh, I picked bananas uh, and mm -hmm. I got to I got to uh, Tel Aviv and uh, I asked the lady at the, this office you know Where's a kibbutz I can go? And she said, she said, well, if do you love bananas? And I said, yeah, I love bananas. And she said, well, I've got the perfect place for you. So we, we ended up on uh, Degani Bek, which is uh, one of the older kibbutzes in Israel in the north, and loved it. It was it was amazing. And there was a group of, you know, 20-year-old, 30-year-olds there, and we just got on really well, made some good friends, and, in fact, met my life partner, who I'm still with now, uh, mm -hmm. you know, many odd years later. And uh, so it was, uh, yeah, it was uh, banana picking is a, was a pivotal moment in my life. 
Yeah, it certainly sounds like it. Do you still love bananas? <laughs> I still love bananas, and uh, and uh, I I would recommend that lifestyle for anyone in terms of just traveling around, just picking up work here and there. We didn't earn anything, but we didn't spend anything. Great connections I made with people there, and kind of a nice tie back. The ultimate community, right? Working on a community. Mm-hmm. Um, so who knew that uh, twenty years later I'd be so deeply in community still. Yeah, it's obviously something that you've consistently felt quite passionate about. And I also um, get the sense from talking to you before we started recording that the sense of adventure hasn't left you either. You mentioned to me that you were considering or in the final stages of planning for a walk that's going to take you quite some distance. What is that walk and why are you doing it? Well, I can tell you what the walk is. It's the Tiaradoa uh, walk, which is from Cape Rang to Bluff, takes four or five months. Why I'm doing it, um, I haven't quite worked out yet. Um, I'm sure it'll become clearer to me when I start it. But I do, the way I frame it at the moment, I think, is that, and this is very off topic with product, but I love it anyway. It's um, like you're on this planet for a short amount of time. When I think about the things that I've done in my life, you kind of look back in this kind of these chapters or these moments that are created, right? And they often just happen to you. And when I had traveled for three years, that that had many chapters in it. There were lots of things that I still remember and enjoy and look back on, right? And I think I felt over the last few years in particular, I haven't created as many of those moments as I would have liked. You know, you, you work a lot, you, you, mm. you family, there's family moments, um, but those sort of really throwing yourself into something new and being very deliberate about creating this new chapter really appeals to me. And so I can't imagine that I would embark on that and it not being like a really pivotal pivotal moment in my life when I look back uh, on mm-hmm. the future. So I, yeah, I just can't wait to see what happens. Oh, no doubt with that much time to yourself alone and your own thoughts that there will be some great things that come out of it. I had actually wondered whether it was something – similar to the reason why people might walk the Camino or the Caminos in, in Europe. Um, and just so people get a sense for just how far that is, because a lot of people listening aren't from New Zealand, it's the entire length of the country. So that's some, um, I think it's, tw- is it 1,200 miles or more? Oh, it's yeah, a- the miles. It's 3,000 kilometres. Uh, yeah, 1,600 so miles. Yeah. yeah, roughly split between the North and the South Island and, uh, yeah, it connects up. A, it tries to connect up a whole lot of trails um, without touching on the great walks. There's some logistical issues about trying to do that um, and trying to reduce the amount of road walking in between. But it's not like the Appalachian or the the PCT. You know, it's not like total wilderness all the time. Which I get the sense mm-hmm. that those trails are a lot more like that. Whereas we have like pockets of wilderness, pockets of urban, bits of sand walking. There's a, there's a whole mixture. It's quite a different experience to some of the other world trails. Well, good to know that you'll be able to get your green tea or your flat white on your way down the country. Absolutely, yeah. Every few days <laughs> you can have a proper a meal and, uh, and a cafe. So, yeah, it'd be good. So, Andrew, you know, something that stood out to me when I was checking out your LinkedIn profile preparing for today's conversation, and this isn't something that's entirely uncommon, but I noticed that you didn't study – product management or start your professional life as a product manager how did you get into product yeah it's pretty common a bit of a trope now right that most people in mm. product didn't come from a product background largely because well what do you do there is no product background right <laughs> it's you a can't, trick question you can't study it so everyone's kind of in that although less people now maybe maybe there's there are starting to become more formal trainings for it but my path was really from uh, I'd studied mathematics and statistics at, at university, so I had a real love of numbers and symmetry and patterns, and and, and that that really appealed to my brain. And thought I was going to be like this statistician, right? And then I went overseas for three years, came back with some tree hugging hippie ideas of what I was going to do. In my life. <laughs> didn't pan out, to be fair, but uh, it certainly didn't have statistics in my path at that time. But I I had uh, I had grown a real interest in computers and software and building and creating stuff uh, it was um that was really interesting to me and so i started tinkering around in that in the sort of statistics field but building the software for statistics and then and then sort of start yeah it was tra- again i didn't get the travel bug out of me for a long time and so i was traveling back and forth to europe with my partner mm-hmm. 
uh, and uh, we would travel a lot and stuff. And so the computing and stuff was good to do contract contracting. But then mm-hmm. I had my first real job. I was actually 30 before I got my first full-time job uh, and uh, at a company called Intigen in Wellington. And they sort of brought me into the under their wing and sort of taught me a whole lot about technology. But very quickly, I gravitated towards leadership roles, uh, working with clients to understand their needs and what we could build for them. They were a service company, um, understanding the business context and being you know close to the business. And you know, mm. I look back now and it's kind of like a no-brainer that that intersection of technology, customer, and business was where I enjoyed playing uh, and increasingly. And so uh, the opportunity to work at zero, uh, I was really looking for a development management role. I wanted to work and help grow development teams Mm. Uh, and they said well we don't have that but we've got this thing that we're calling product development manager Uh, and I thought okay I have no idea what that means but I love what you're doing as a company and uh, very grateful that I jumped on that train when I did and started to take what I thought was everything about software was all agile this agile that capital A right and um, and it turned out to be a lot bigger than agile uh, in terms of trying to get value through to customers and, and all the good things that we we talk about in product and so that mm. was our journey into it and we didn't even talk about product management back then in 2009 but uh over from that time on i started to grow and read more and grow my understanding of what it was all about and i found my place mm. and i understand there's a connection between intergen and zero through rod jury is that true yeah, so he was, uh, I'm, was he a founder at Intigen? But he was there in the early days with Tony Stewart, uh, the CEO, and left before I had started, actually. So I knew of him. I hadn't met him at the time. Uh, he went off and did Aftermail and a few other things um, mm-hmm. before he um, came and started Zero. And so, yeah, there was a lot of people I knew there. So it was kind of a nice nice place to work as well. I knew some of the people who used to be at Intigen even and had moved to zero over the years. Uh, so it was, I mean, that's a good thing about Wellington, right? We're a mm. small, smallish city, very connected. You can walk from one end to the other. Uh, it's a great place if you're into community and networking, right? Like everyone mm. knows. Yeah, that's. Um, I'm always surprised every time I go home and walk up Cooper Street. I'm bound to run into one or two people that I haven't seen in a few years. Yeah, right. It's a great. It's a great place. Yeah, and I feel sorry for people in Auckland, right? Because like, I go up there and I try and, you know, I'm used to going like finding someone or hearing someone online who's in maybe in product or something and reaching out to them and say, "Hey, I'd love to talk to you and have a coffee," right? Like you try and do that in Auckland, and they're over in Takapuna or something, or I don't know, some different part of the city, and it's like, well, actually, they can't easily come and have a coffee with you because they can't meet you. And I suspect it's like that in a lot of big cities around the around the world. So I love the fact that we can uh, easily connect. Yeah, and thank thank God for the internet, so to speak. Well, that's that makes it easier. Yeah. Hey, one of the things at Zero, as I mentioned in your introduction, that you're really well known for is building out that product organization, although it didn't sound like that was the way it was framed when you, at least when you first joined. And I imagine that in doing that, you learned many, many things, and no doubt we'll hear about some of those today. But one of the things that caught my attention when I was preparing for today's talk was I heard you say that you learned to say no without saying no. What does that look like, and how did you come to learn that? I don't know. I, yeah, I only reflected on that a couple of years ago. Maybe I, I was thinking more about that as a as more and more people that I would coach as product leaders would come to me and say, you know, I'm just getting all this pressure to do shit, and it's like oh, I'm on this thing. You can edit that out. Uh, we'll leave it in. It's it's all good. It's it's an adults only podcast. <laughs> okay, um, I, and so so it's a really common problem that people have. They don't they don't know how, they don't know how to say no to people, right? And my I feel like I've never said no to anybody, but I also have never just capitulated to everything that's asked of me, right? And mm-hmm. so I think there's a really important skill as a as an effective influencer of direction when you're in the, the difficult position of being a product leader where you have a lot of people wanting something from you, all from their own corners, you have to build really strong relationships with all those stakeholders, and you don't do that by being the no person. 
You yeah. don't, you don't, you don't be that guy. I'm just too busy, right? You see my roadmap. I showed you last week. I'm just not doing it. Okay, just stop <laughs> asking me. Like that's not how you build bridges and build connections with people. And so, but it's not to say that the opposite is what you do. It's not like yes, whatever you want. I'll change direction right now, right? And so there's this there's this area in the middle which is not saying no, but no might be the result. And mm-hmm. you need to have people need to feel heard. And I I learned this. I learned this a lot with Rod because he was an ideas person, he, thinking a million miles an hour, five years ahead of everybody, an amazing person to be around and to be inspired by. I really enjoyed the time I had working with Rod. and But I could imagine, and I know, some people found it really frustrating because every day you'd have a different idea or, you know, different, you know sometimes you'd stretch it, right? Whereas um, I like to hear those ideas and, and he never made me feel um, that I was letting him down by not doing all the things he was asking of me, mm-hmm. right? That was his, I don't know if he knew it was a magic source of his, but he, he I'm sure he was frustrated that things didn't happen faster, like what, what founder isn't, right? <laughs> he, I think he knew intrinsically that it was his job to inspire and throw ideas around that formed the story of our strategy, actually, and we, maybe we talk about that later, but this whole, whole idea that the whole company understood where we were going and what was important because of his brain bouncing around the domain, the space that he wanted to influence, created this sort of clarity that you absorbed, well, I did at least, and mm-hmm. it didn't mean that I had to do all the things, but it created this understanding of the opportunities that were ahead of us. And so the approach was less no we can't do all those things right now which was the fact but i love to hear more about that and tell me more about why that's a great opportunity and mm-hmm. what you know what could we do with that and so it became more of a conversation starter about what we might do in the future rather than what we had to change right now and mm-hmm. i remember really like that it sounds like you would take those requests and then try and dig in deeper to them with the people that were giving them to you so you could understand more about where they were coming from and why they felt it was important yeah so yeah absolutely and it's like it's a fundamental premise of product right you got to understand where those typically solution requests are coming from to be able to prioritize them and see if they have uh yeah substance to to maybe you should change your direction um mm. but uh, but but uh, but at the, you know, like there's a lot of emphasis put on prioritization, right? When it comes to products, and you know, there's always too many things to do. But the, this ability to build those relationships so that people don't stop coming to you with ideas, and that they they feel heard, they because they're all they're all right. Like every single request, like Zero just had you know hundreds of smart people working in there, right? And it didn't matter where in the organization you were, you, you had a good idea, right? And it made sense to you and to the to the pain you might have been feeling on support or in mm-hmm. testing or in finance or in sales and marketing, right? Those, those requests were really important to you. And so to dismiss them with a no, I'm too busy, it's just not right. It's just not on. You can't do it, right? They have to feel heard and they have to understand why their thing might not happen right now. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not a dismissive thing that you that you should be doing with those people. And, in fact, later on it became you, you're assisted in that ability to say no by a clear strategy, by having a direction that you've all bought into, which means that certain things don't happen as quick as you might like them to. Hmm. Well, seeing as we're talking about strategy, let's go into that now. It's a term that often gets bandied around and it seems to have many different meanings depending on who you talk to. From your way of looking at it, Tokes, what is product strategy? I typically don't preface it with product because I think strategy is the same whether it's a product strategy, or sales strategy, or marketing strategy. So I think mm-hmm. you're tied up a little bit about whether you're talking about product or the business strategy. Um, but I, but to me, a strategy is, um, and it's easy to say a strategy is the is the path to a vision, right? Like that's the kind of the top level description of what strategy is i want to be here and this is how this is the path i'm going to take to get there right but it's actually more than that because if if you just literally looked at that you go well tell me what i have to do and i'll do it along the path Mm -hmm. right it'll just become a list of things that you want to do and in fact many people will describe their strategy as a list of things they want to do to achieve the vision which Mm -hmm. is not their strategy they're the punchline of a strategy potentially but they're not the strategy and so what I like to think of with the strategy is the meat and the sandwich between your goals and the things you're going to do, 
right? And you can't just say our strategy is to be 20 times bigger. You can't just say our strategy is to do these 20 things. It's what sits in between. And you know you don't have a strategy when you can't critique the things you're doing in any reasonable way. So, you know, put two things in front of me, should I, which one should I do? Well, it depends what our strategy is. And if I can't, and if they both look really good, then maybe the strategy is not tight enough or not being articulated well enough to help you make some of those bigger decisions. But really describing those, that, that meet in the middle there, right? And I got a lot of that framing um, from the work of Richard Rimmelton, Good Strategy, mm-hmm. Bad Strategy. It's a book that gets referred to a lot. But And I, I read it, and it, it was really a business strategy book and it missed some framing for me in terms of bringing it back into product land. And so this is when I start thinking of that. He, he talks about a kernel, right, which is like this diagnosis, which is kind of what I think of as the opportunity. And he has a policy, which is what I think of as the hypothesis to addressing that. So he frames it slightly differently. But in its essence, it's trying to say the same thing. Um, but then but then the, the tricky bit for people in product who look at strategy, you might have a really well-formed strategy, but there still should be work for you to do to discover that value in the product, right? So the strategy doesn't just tell you what to do and you go off and build it. The strategy might have an action of improving onboarding or, um, you know, like um, creating a a mobile experience for a certain type of customer, right? It -hmm. still requires you to do some more discovery of the opportunities within those actions and to obviously do solution discovery to find out the best way to solve those opportunities that are ahead of you. But it's in the context of those strategic actions and the strategic themes that might have appeared there so that um, you're now everything you do as a product person is not just delivering some cool stuff and then somebody else in the business measures revenue and retention and doesn't attribute anything to what you've done necessarily and you're kind of like in this sort of Doing, you might be doing great delivery work, but you don't really know if you're making an impact. Mm. And so there's a there's a lot of stuff to think about about connecting the dots between what you and your teams do and create, and linking that back up to the strategic framing of a well defined strategy. Mm. Then your value will be much more clear to people like Serge who doesn't know what we're worth. So it sounds like product strategy when applied sorry strategy when applied to product helps you frame what you should be building but the role of product is still to decide how that should be built and manage the trade-offs that exist within the context of what you should be building to achieve the strategy yeah i think there's the strategy indicates a, some of the what but there's more work to do but it importantly frames the why to qualify that the what is the right thing to do, that it was the best what to do for the why you came up with, right? Mm. And if you're not aligned, then you can build the wrong thing or build too much of a thing. And so strategy should inform the why so that the what is in the right sort of context. Mm. Something else that interests me is the way in which organizational structure impacts the role that product plays and therefore their ability to achieve a particular product strategy. What has been your experience of organizational structure and how it's either enabled or disabled the organization to achieve that strategy? Yeah, it's a really big topic because the first dynamic is that most companies form as a big team, like one big cohesive team, right? I often think startups despite the, all the attention they get, they actually have it quite easy in terms of communications, generally not a problem. They don't have customers screaming at them because they don't have any. Um, and uh, they've really just got often quite a singular goal that they're trying to achieve to try and make create some market fit, right? But this, this sort of single team concept um, evolves into, um, often evolves into a CEO running half of this ball and hiring more salespeople and marketing people and other people in the organization to help keeping it going. Maybe the CTO, probably the CTO is building up the capability to deliver and to continue Mm. to deliver on all the things and opportunities that exist. And you tend to have these two halves where this half thinks about strategy and this half thinks about delivering really well. And 
that can work and does work because it's it's exactly how most companies evolve. Um, while the often the CEO maintains that product leadership role, so they're still connecting with this part of the business, communicating intent and strategy and why we're doing it. There's some joint celebration that happens, but at a certain point they can't. They're off raising money. They're doing other things. They're building it. They're getting office space. And they, they, they call me and say, can you make that other half of my organization go faster? Um, <laughs> solve that problem for me because I don't think they know what's important anymore. Do they know that we've only got a runway of six months and they're still mucking around with tech debt? Uh, can you just solve that problem, right? And they think it's the, the role of product um, to be able to do that. There's a whole other conversation about whose responsibility that is. But, but the, the problem is that um, how do you transition from this single cohesive group to an increasingly separated uh, delivery and the rest um, part of the business. And what what happens is that there's this awkward teenage period where you may be 15 engineers, that sort of size, 10 to 15 engineers, where you almost could start specialising their activities based off probably or ideally those strategic themes Mm -hmm. fall out of a, a well thought through strategy you'll have some themes that come out of it and it's nice to align <clears throat> we all know that we want to align teams with purpose to something that matters to the business that's it's persistent it's not just feature teams building features but it's actually well i'm the team that looks after this type of customer or this product mm -hmm. and you can do that by looking at a a, a a strategy and seeing what falls out and so there's this awkward period as companies evolve and product organizations evolve where they'll solve this problem by putting a junior product owner over here, first time they've been in a product role, didn't realize it was a leadership position, just thought they were going to make them go faster, do a bit of whip cracking and do some you know, roadmaps, right? And what it actually needs is someone a lot more senior and influential to bring these parts of the business together and start forming a plan for how you're going to scale the product organization. <clears throat> And what typically happens is that I know someone wrote recently or someone pointed me to an article written about the first product hire is often a bit of a sacrificial lamb because they brought <laughs> it for the wrong reasons and just get flamed and, you know, it was never going to work for them. Uh, so you need to bring on somebody if you're looking to specialise your product organisation who can has seen this evolution happen before and can be hands-on in those early days because if you're the first product person who is still quite senior, you're going to have to touch all parts of the business, including the delivery side of the business, right? So you can't mm -hmm. just go in there and just jazz hands. You've got to actually, um, you know, practice what you preach as well. And so it takes a certain type of person to be that first product leader um, to then also be able to stand back and let others take over when you start to hire them. I think it, like I keep going on about strategy, right? But it does underpin a lot of things, right? And I don't like to, in fact, I almost like to rebrand it and give it a different name. But it, but it, it, the idea of describing what's most important to a business right now is critical to every other part of the business. So they know where to put their energy, right? And it impacts a product organization even more because their value is in creating value through the software that aligns with what's most important to the business. And so a lot of problems come when that's not clear and, or the strategy changes a lot or it's really just whatever the CEO heard at the latest, you know, you know, career fair or, or market fair that they went to, right? Like it's, um, it's really hard when those things are changing or if you don't have any influence over it. Yeah, it reminds me of that saying – make a decision that removes a thousand other decisions. It sounds mm -hmm. like when that product strategy is clear, whether it's right or wrong or will prove to be effective in the marketplace is another matter. Yeah. But it's almost like you remove that load off teams and executives within the organization that when they're presented with alternatives of things that they could be doing, that it's more obvious what they should be doing. Yeah. And I, I the other key point I reckon is sometimes because I think strategy needs a rebrand, uh, people think it's like a six month, twelve monthly offsite, right? So they put <laughs> a lot of emphasis on, oh, you're gonna, I'm, I'm doing strategy right now, um, and they get the PowerPoint out and they start sort of creating slides, right? So there's this fundamentally strategy is hard to create and define, but it should be easy to express, right? Mm. And so um, easy to express is not a twenty point, a twenty page PowerPoint, 
right? That's hard to express. So at, certainly at zero, and I think one of the reasons why initially we were successful is that the strategies that we followed, I almost didn't even know they were a strategy. I certainly didn't use the S word, and they, but they were very clear what they were. And, the, and, and, and probably what, and I don't know if it was only in hindsight, I only really analyzed it in hindsight because it was just what we lived and breathed. We just knew why we existed and who we were trying to help and what our approach was to enter the market and how we were measuring that and success. Everybody felt it, right? And that, Rod was a big part of that, but also the fact that he had people around him that echoed some of the genesis of ideas that he seeded, right? So there were... Um, and, and it helped conversations, right? It helped us say, to your first point, it helped us say no when the inevitable happened when we just had too much to do and not enough time or people, right? So we had to say yeah. no and ultimately not do things that some people wanted us to. Um, but that was aided by a relatively clear strategy around how we were going to enter the markets that we did and in what order and what the relative importance of those markets was at any point in time. And some of them were, you know, UK had to wait a long time in the early days for us to build UK specific features. And I remember mm. meetings where we, had, where we had to tell Gary, who was the C, you know, the GM up there, that we couldn't do those things that he wanted, despite the fact that his customers were screaming for it. He was losing sales because of it. It hurt, right? It hurt big mm. time. He's feeling a lot better about it now, I, I suspect. But uh, <laughs> but at the time, it was it was hard graft. And so, and that only really came about because we were very aligned on strategy, without using that word, and that alignment. If there was one thing I had to would have to put my finger on in terms of why as a product organization we've succeeded, it was that alignment stayed there for a long time. And I don't know I don't know what it's like now, whether people are all over the place. I suspect not. Um, but um, it was it was really clear. We didn't have niggles, we didn't ever talk about the business like mm. most of my clients end up talking. And that the business is when you're like this, right? And you're over here getting screamed at, and the business is telling you what to do. I, that, I never felt that um, my whole time at zero. And that's a real yeah. sentiment, right? And maybe I was in, had blinkers on or something. I'm sure some people felt it. But but in my role, I never felt that. I always felt the product had a role at the table, was valued. You know, Rod would say, he probably said it's every person in the organization, you know, you guys are the most valuable people in the business. And he put us on stage at zero cons. He made sure that we had a presence. He gave us a lot of freedom. There's a lot of freedom in, in, at zero to do what you need to do as a product leader. And so I, I try not to always refer back to zero because I've worked with 40 companies since I worked, left zero, right, in the business that I run now. And so mm. I have a perspective of how other companies are running. But there was something special about zero that it, it just has some really good, uh, you know, reminders in there about how to run successful product companies. Yeah, and there's a few things in there that you've touched on. You've touched on the use of language, like how the business as a whole thinks about itself and talks about itself, that it um, sounded like it didn't intentionally create silos, it didn't pitch people against each other. It felt like it was a very inclusive company where everybody was working and aligned to a strategy and a clear mission. Now, that reminds me of the term culture, you know, product culture is often talked about almost as much as product strategy. You mentioned that you've worked with big companies like Xero. You also had uh, some experience before that at Intergen and after that at 8i. And since you've started your coaching business with 40 other organizations, what does a great product culture look like to you? And why is it important? So it's kind of a nice umbrella term for how product is perceived and valued within an organization and so when i th think of a healthy product culture i i think of a i, th I think of people in the organization who are working work, have some ideals and principles around how product should operate within the context of a business and are in a healthy way, promoting those practices and principles and behaviors through the way in which they communicate throughout the business, the way in which they talk to each other, the way in which they value insights, uh, the way they value connection with customer and how they um, 
how they want to bring value to customers through the products that they create. I, I, I don't think it, you know, like you can be doing, uh, you can be doing agile really well. You can be doing scrum really well. You can be doing standups every day on time for the right length of time with the right, li- but that's not product culture. They're, they're like things you do. Whereas product culture is rod at zero. I'm going to use another zero example is rod at zero saying, our product managers are some of the most valuable people in this company. Hmm. That's him creating a culture of acceptance of these roles and the value that they hold and the importance that they have. It's not just the people who are in the product team creating that culture. It's how it's perceived across the entire organization and the value. And it's meaning it's, it's so that Surge could never say, I don't know what you're worth. Hmm. Right, it's like mm. and most companies they they don't know, and it's it's not like you can go well. I've got five engineers and they're worth one hundred twenty thousand dollars each, and so you know half a million dollars or so is what the value they need to create each year. So I'm going to work at look at each release and put a dollar figure on it. It's not as simplistic as sales and marketing. Sorry, I mean mm. marketing people, but in terms oh, they don't they don't they don't listen to this podcast anyway. So I'll put down on them. But you know they they um they're, they have a lot of easier job to measure their value. And so this this idea of how of of constantly refining how you reflect your value, or how you reflect the value of the people. It's not you as a product leader either. It's how you reflect the value of those people that are building stuff that has inherent value, and how that maps to what the company cares about is is a big part of your role. And so, um, product culture is is a lot about how you express how you express and how others express the value of that product organization and the, mm. the value that you that you operate within. Now, I understand that after zero, you went to work at another organization, as I mentioned in your introduction, eight mm. I, and that you've spoken quite openly about your time and departure from 8i and i believe it's related to what we've just been discussing around product culture i just want to quote you now Don't worry. You've, you said <laughs> you said my naive thought was that i could go in there and make a difference in terms of helping them to define what this product is for it was probably to be fair my biggest failure in my career i didn't make the impact i wanted to there how does that statement and reflecting back on what we've just talked about product culture how do those two things relate so my role there was interesting right it was a huge learning for me so i went in there believing i one of my superpowers was my ability to empathize with a range of people from low level data engineers you know right through to the ceo like i, I could engage with any part of business and create those relationships that we talked about being really important as part of product culture. Mm -hmm. I I found I didn't uh, engage in the right way uh, at the right time or the right, I don't, you know, I haven't fully analyzed what I could have done differently, but there were certain parts of the organization that felt threatened by my presence, by my influence. And um, it was a, it was, a relationship that I couldn't improve mm-hmm. and felt like I was missing a trick somewhere. And I, mm-hmm. I don't know. And so that was difficult for me in a company that was driven by that part, you know, the, the part of the organization I found hard to engage with were, and they probably didn't even realize it, were in the driver's seat for a lot of product decisions. They were actually mm. creating the value. They were, they were technical people, researchers. They were creating a lot of the value that that was the value of the company, right? And so it was hard for me to then express and to influence the direction and value that we should create to be a viable business. And that was hard. And the company you know, ultimately ran out of money, and a lot of people had to leave. And they're still going, but uh, you know that was that was difficult to reconcile. You know, like as a product leader, that was my job to find value for the efforts. So, you know, my definition of a product leader's value is to maximize the return on investment of the efforts of the people with whom you're working with. And I was working with the, those researchers and the, the web people, and there was a whole lot of people creating the value. But I didn't feel like I could maximize that return or, or you know, it would not mm. 
at least. And so that was that was hard to hard to take. And you know, I hadn't really felt that I hadn't succeeded in other parts of my career. So that it was it was a good reckoning of you know what would I have done differently if I'd had my time over there. So that definition that you just gave of being a product leader, that is sounds like at least a lot to take on your shoulders. And then when you run into a situation like that and aren't able to execute on your own intrinsic definition of your worth in the organization, I mean, I can't imagine that must have been super difficult. But thinking about your experience at 8i and then contrasting it against potentially Zero or Ford against some of the great product organizations that you've subsequently worked with, what would you say the key difference or differences are that en that enabled you in the past and have enabled you in the future to really live up to that definition of product leadership? For me personally, well, one of the interesting things is I, as a coach, um, I don't need to um, because <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a comment, right? Like I, I've, I've kind of like um, – the way the way I see it is that I have been through a number of experiences in my career mm. and working through others in, in, in my business, and in a way that I could never do when I was in the business in the role, I've gained clarity of thought around how to be influential, how to be a good leader, the things that matter, the things that don't matter so much, and I sometimes feel guilty that. I didn't do half the things I talk about now. I didn't, I didn't decompose strategy like I just described before. You know, when I was at zero, I didn't uh, even know what a product manager was. I, I, you know, like there was a lot of things I didn't do. Deep discovery. I didn't talk to enough customers at times, and so there's a lot of things that I have. I've, I've only really dawned on me at a much deeper level because I'm not doing the job anymore. And so I might feel guilty about not having done it and not practicing what I preach, but I I try and help those people who are, were like me and blind to the potential impact they could have and try and help them to see what I didn't see at the time. And it's not like I hate that meme where people said, oh, I'm going to tell you not to do all the mistakes that I did, right? And there's not like big mistakes that I'm going to say, well, you see, what that happened to me. You just don't do that, right? Like it's not, that's, doesn't, that's not true right um mm -hmm. it, but there's awareness you have of how to be an effective leader an appreciation that it is a leadership role which half of the product people i meet don't haven't appreciated yet they think they're a get shit done person right but that's that's not a leader a leader enables others to get stuff done and make sure that the stuff done is the right stuff to be done influences people who don't want to be influenced right that's that's the role of a, of a leader, and so I, I, yeah, I don't know if I've answered your question, but I, I, but to me, it's like an, it's like um, the impact I have now is quite different, but it's it's through the lens of an, an awareness of the things that I think are much more important than I realised at the time. Mm. You no, know, I want to come back to this definition of what a product leader is in a second, mm. but I just want to chat briefly about what I. What I heard when you were talking about the difference in experience between Zero and 8i, and it sounded to me that the ability of the senior product leader or leaders and the evolution of the product culture relied heavily on the leadership that the CEO exhibited and the language and the overall strategy and culture that they embodied in the organization which then enabled the product culture to be successful. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? When I said there was perfect alignment at zero at all times, that was not the case at 8i. And it's not that we weren't didn't like each other. We really enjoyed working together. I, I, really, I, I really respected and valued all the people I worked with at 8i. But I don't think we were super aligned on how to execute the business and mm. and how to realize the value at the right time there was a fundamental tension between um doing the best research and applying that research to solving this deeply technical problem of holographic representation right that the 
the imperatives there were quite different to achieving some revenue goals and driving the business forward to give it time to realize the potential of the, those amazing holograms. Mm. And I don't think we quite worked out the best path. We ran out of time, essentially. And mm. so, we, you know, the, the classic example to me is was the, you know, we proven we had some traction on mobile, uh, you know, showcasing possibly the lowest fidelity holograms we could through a mobile phone, you know, it's like, um, and it was really hard to get the rest of the organization to invest in mobile first because their principle was highest quality first and then we'll make it work in mobile. Mm. Obviously it takes a lot longer to get, to get value to customers because most customers couldn't see the highest value stuff because it required expensive headgear, um, you know, that not everybody had. And so th mm. those were sort of questions that we talked about, right? Like we talked about this tension, but I don't think we ever re resolved it enough to align the entire company on a strategy that would have created some value in market earlier than it, than it happened to do. Mm. I mean, this is a really, I think, critical point for people listening to take away is just how important it is to be aligned, to have a clear view on what you're all working to mm -hmm. in order that you don't have friction uh, amongst different departments or yeah. functional areas and that the decisions that you're making on a daily basis right from the small ones up into the very big ones become clear when you've got alternate options in front of you. I think it's yeah. it's a really valuable point that you've made, Andrew. But it's not, but, but also it's good to point out, right, like uh, perfect alignment would have been great. We could have aligned on you know, maybe maybe someone else in the organization would disagree and say, well, we did align. We said that quality was the most important thing and that's where we went. And I guess you could, you know, we did, right? Like we might not have all thought it was the right thing, but we did do it, right? So we maybe mm. had buy-in. But we probably could have been more honest about, you know, the, the time that that might take and the opportunities that presented. And so it's not only about alignment, it's also about being honest. We, I, I personally was under the drug of VRAR, right? Like, I, it was amazing. I love talking mm -hmm. about it. I loved, uh, and, you know, we had this great line, you know, this narrative where you just stay about people used to draw humans on caves, on the walls of caves. And then, then we, uh, you know, like we did, um, what was after caves? I don't know. I, I want to go TV, but I feel like there's something in between caves and the TV. Um, but, you know, then we started doing silent movies and then, you know, movies with sound. And then we, you know, mm. so this progression of representing ourselves in different media was a really compelling story. Like who doesn't want to, you know, you put on a headset and walk into a room with yourself, mm. a, a moving version of yourself that you can walk around and look at. It's deeply moving, right? Like there was, there was a mm. lot of really powerful messages that, that the technology that I could do. So I fell in love with that and that whole world of VR and AR. Um, and I think I probably lost sight of the, of the business realities around, you know, uh, achieving the impact we needed at the right time and with the right people to give mm -hmm. us the time to, you know, realize the potential. And they're still going, right? Like I just saw a post recently, there's still a small part of the organization running and they're still creating stuff and there's, you know, they're still fighting, right? And so who knows where it might go. But uh, for me, the timing, this wasn't quite right for a lot of other people who went through the business at that time. Hmm. So just coming back to the definition that you gave of product leadership, and I'll just recount mm. that for people listening. So you said you're accountable for the return on investment of the collective efforts and outcomes created through the teams you work with. Mm. Now, there are a few key words in there, and one that I want to focus on specifically is the word with, because it implies that as the product manager or the product leader, that you don't have direct control necessarily over the people that you're responsible for managing in order to achieve the outcome. Is that a fair interpretation of what you meant with that description? Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I, I hadn't picked up on that subtlety of the use of the word with, but you're right. It's not a matter of, well, I'm going to define, decide what the value is and what we're going to build and I'm going to work, I'm going to get these people to make it, right? That That's not the, the role. The word that's, it, it is a, a hugely collaborative exercise and, if you think, I mean, you've got a design background. If you think of the double diamonds, right, you've got this sort of exploring the opportunities out there, refining your understanding which opportunities you want to address first. Then you look at solutions, right, and then you come back down to one solution that has the value, right? And mm. so as a product leader, you're spending much more time in that first diamond of 
exploring the opportunities and really articulating and validating that they're worth going for, right? And then I, I've done this visualization. I haven't quite nailed it yet. Um, but then in terms of your involvement, you're involved in the – if people, people need to have the double diamond in front of them. You're, you're involved in the first – little piece of the second diamond in that mm -hmm. your role there is the really explaining to the team the opportunity in front of them and mm -hmm. why it matters. And you're 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 gonna be involved in that looking around for solutions and exploring it. But your team specially design are really set up for doing that solution discovery to the problem that you've identified as is worth solving and mm -hmm. enabling the team to come up with things that you on your own couldn't possibly have come up with uh, is 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 a big part of your role is to step back as much as you can so that they can then own the impact of the solutions that they're coming up with. Now, I even as I'm saying that, I'm criticizing myself because I've just given you the textbook answer of, of how product people are supposed to work. In many businesses that I've been involved in, the the solution is is some is is potentially some aspect of the solution is actually pretty obvious. Like if mm. you take, um, can I do a non-zero example? Um, oh no, I'm just going to do it. Uh, so if you take zero, right, you're running a small business. I need to create an invoice. Mm. So at some point when you had to build an invoice, the ability to generate an invoice, it's a legal document, has certain requirements, right? And so you could argue that that actually is not the team decide, doing any solution discovery. They're actually doing um, design discovery. Hmm. which is arguably another diamond in this this thing right like, there's, a, there's a whole lot of work that has to go to go well i know kind of the fundamentals of what this framework of the solution is but there's lots of potentially lots of way i could manifest that in the product so you're not finding hmm. the solution you're finding design and so i think enabling your team to do that discovery of solution and design is really important um, and for them to understand how you're going to measure success or how as a group you're going to measure success and then your role of storyteller is saying, well, if we solve this problem or this opportunity, um, then, you know, this is going to happen. And maybe with the invoicing example, maybe the success is that, you know, it, um, there's a, there may be this certain um, speed of creation might be, in, maybe that's important. You want to be able to have it so easy that someone could create an invoice um, on the fly. Or it may be that you want to create an invoice in mobile first. Maybe there's some aspects of who's going to use this invoicing that's more important than other types of customers. So there's still refinement of the opportunity that can happen beyond just build invoices. And mm. in fact, what's super interesting with Xero, uh, have, is they've evolved from an invoicing team um, uh, to a group of people who are focused on helping customers get paid faster. And that framing is is really beautiful, right? Because now I have mm -hmm. a team that might be working on invoicing and might be solving that problem. But then they could also just, you know, I could come to them and say, well, the biggest problem with getting paid faster is that it's really hard for people to pay your invoice. And so they might do a whole lot of work from, you know, payments or different wording within the invoice templates, different ways of following up on payments not made. You know, there's lots of things they might do there to come up with, really come up with solutions to that problem rather than just building a feature. Mm, and it's, I mean, that's the key, key thing that stood out for me there in that example is that w one team is building a feature, the other is focused on a customer outcome. Mm. And e even of itself, that's a microcosm of clarity of strategy mm. because it, it gives you the question to sense check multiple options against, which is how does this help customers get paid faster? Yeah. And, and it's a very fundamental understanding of small business, you know, mm. From day one, we used to say cash flow is king. It's kind of like the accountant's catch cry, right? Like, and so, and so we knew that that was really important. And so, there's a lot of work that's gone into that product to actually enable people to get paid faster, to mm. make that value in their marketing in terms of you know, if you turn on this feature, you'll get paid ten times faster. You know, the, mm. those sorts of things all come back to a, a potentially unwritten down strategy of helping small business do what they care about the most. Mm. And, yeah, I think that role of the product leader to elicit that thread of logic and causality and hypothesis into a reason for doing a certain piece of work or exploring types of work is, is where the role of a product leader can make a huge difference in connecting those dots. Mm. It sort of speaks to me of framing what it is that we need to achieve without directing the hands and the way in which it 
it, it is achieved. Yeah. You mentioned storytelling as a key word in, in something you said just a second ago. And I know that in your one of your workshops, Increasing Your Impact, where you work with product leaders to take their skills to the next level, one of the key topics you cover is telling a good story in less than 30 seconds. Mm. Why is that so important for product managers or leaders? And how does one tell a good story in 30 seconds or less? Yeah, so it's important because nobody reads what you write down. And so you can <laughs> write down a strategy, you can do whatever you like, you can put it up on Confluence, you can force it down their throat. People don't read what you write. So if you think communicating stuff by documenting it is going to work, it, it might work for an engineer who needs a specific specification of some logic in your program, I don't know, but if they really mm -hmm. need it. Because people are busy, right? They don't read stuff. And so if that's... If, if you can suspend belief and think that that's vaguely true, then, well, how else are you going to communicate intent? How else are you going to communicate why you're doing something, right? And so storytelling is an aspect of it, and I'm not an expert in storytelling other than that the structure of it needs to mirror somewhat that strategic framing of goal, opportunity, hypothesis, action, right? There's that, And what, what I find fascinating is that that decomposition that I've come up with is exactly the same as um, understanding the problem, who benefits from solving that problem, what solution are you going to, what's your hypothesis of solution, how are you going to measure it worked. Right? That's mm. what I mean that we all talk about. Don't fall in love with the solution, understand the problem. Well, you can map that almost one-to-one -to, -one to a strategic decomposition, right? So we've taken strategic theory and almost bypass strategy and come to the sort of understand the problem before you go to the solution thing, which is closer to the metal of building stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of what we think about in product, I think is really interesting because we we think we're creating a new discipline, but we're actually just repurposing a discipline that's existed forever, which is just running a business, right? That the, the a business operates on solving problems for a customer and understanding that problem really well and finding value, right? When you, so this is why product leaders have such a tough time because they're so, their reason for being is the same as the CEOs or the founder, right? The founder started the whole business, especially a software business, on this premise of knowing the problem, solving it, measuring it worked, right? Mm -hmm. And so then they bring someone else in who has the same motivation so how do they work together so how does it how does a cpo and a ceo work together without doing the same job um and so i think there's lots of really interesting stuff in there about how you yeah so so how you tell these stories is part of of that role you have because nobody reads it so being inspirational is really important and most inspirational people can spin a good yarn or, mm. And maybe it's not, maybe you're not, you know, Barack Obama. Maybe maybe you don't have amazing gift to give. So I don't want to make it feel like you all have to be super extroverted to be a product leader. But the, you can tell a story in your actions as well, in your behavior, in the small comments you make to direct a narrative, the yeah. correction of some incorrect assumption there's a lot of things you have control over and can influence hearts and minds without standing up on a podium and telling a really riveting story. So I think we sometimes think storytelling is like this. You have, almost have to write a small novel, right? But it's... Um, but it, be, be an Anthony Robbins kind of standing yeah. up on the chair, you know, yelling from the rafters, we're going this way. Yes. And so I, what I try and do is like, yes, the, the 30 second thing was me, a little bit of a gimmicky thing in that course where we... We decompose a thing that they've worked on in the past to its problem, who benefits from solving it, the solution, the outcome. And I and that analysis takes a bit of thinking, right, even for something mm -hmm. you've already built. that They kind of have to go, why did we do it again? Who actually used it? Um, <laughs> and so, so they go through that exercise, and then can they then sort of give me the punchy version of that, which is kind mm -hmm. of like what you might do if a new member joins your team how would you quickly get them up to speed with why this thing is important and how does it relate to something higher up the chain? Mm -hmm. And that should be, you should be able to say that reasonably simply. You shouldn't have to go, well, sit down, grab a coffee. Let me explain <laughs> to you, right? Like it should be a little bit more punchy. And sure, eventually you'll unravel more of the backstory, but there the should be an easy entry point to understand the value of the thing that you're working on. But, mm -hmm. but interestingly, that storytelling, right? So I say you can 
the way in which you engage with everyone around you, the way you communicate is part of this story that you're creating. So even these functional aspects of your role, like creating a roadmap, a dashboard, you know, both those two artifacts are perfect examples of where you can integrate your story into those typically poorly done artifacts. So your roadmap, roadmap could be streamed by a strategic theme now, not by the team working on it. Hmm. Or the technology stream, right? You f- you frame it in terms of to to uh, to win in the US, which is a strategic theme that has a number of strategies. We're doing these things right now, and then the second two quarters we're doing nothing because we're going to work on this other strategic theme, which is winning in Australia or whatever the you know improved conversion or whatever the other themes might be that you uncover. And so hmm. it's a perfect way to illustrate the alignment of your efforts to what matters across the entire business and to you know try and get people when they do a demo which people generally do demos to say is this okay is this what you wanted whereas the demo should be should start it's like doing a pitch it's like doing a i, ask, I tell people to watch a there's a podcast called startup right by the gimlet crew mm-hmm. right probably your podcast person you probably know them right really good show to listen to how people pitch a business. So this is where we've taken product people have taken a business concept of doing a pitch, mm-hmm. and now we have to do it internally when we're demoing a feature or or pitching an idea, right? And you've got to do the same thing. You've got to lay out this is what happens in the world. This is the context that we're operating in and why it sucks. I think these people are under a lot of pain and are doing things really poorly right now. It's costing them time and money. I've got this idea that I think I can solve that by doing this, and I'll know I've done it, and I know I I know it's a good idea because here's some outcomes that have happened as a result of my initial forays into the market. That mm. framing is a story framing, but it's the same as your strategy framing. It's the same as your you know problem statement, and so and it's it's as good as sitting down with a really pithy story that you might be telling your team at some point in time. So I think there's lots of things. It's about communicating intent and that might be a good story, but it could, there's also lots of other things you do day to day. And it goes back to your product culture, right? It's product culture is culture is pervasive, right? It's not just a offsite. It's mm. like, a, it's, it's in everything you do and say. And I think the way you communicate intent and purpose and reason for being and value is a, is a big part of your role. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And not to sort of knock us off our positive high that we've just been on there with the importance of storytelling, but I've also he- heard you describe uh, product leadership as the art of managing disappointment. And that doesn't sound mu- like much fun. What did you mean by that? I think I was trying, it was a bit of a reality check to people who thought it might have been. There's two schools, right, of people who are attracted to product. We don't have this as much. I think it might be an, an American problem. I hear a lot of it from American commentary, whereas some people think product management is the ability to be in a position to control what gets built. So I'm a really deep domain expert in this area, and you often find internal hires have this perspective. They go, well, I've been in this business for ages. I know what these customers want. I'm just going to be in that driver's seat to tell the team what to build, right? Mm. And so they see it more as a direction rather than anything brokering hard conversations, right? Or you come from a perspective of um, I'm really organized. I've worked in engineering teams before. I know how to spell JIRA, and I think I can be really effective in this and coordinating the activities of this team. Mm -hmm. So neither of those two things think you're the – you know, mastering the art of managing disappointment until they get into the role and realize that they've got 65 different opinions flying at them and how <laughs> many customers all thinking you're doing the wrong thing at the wrong time and not for me. And you have to find some way of brokering a path through there and still feel good about yourself at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Because it's brutal, right? Like nobody likes to not satisfy. It's a human, it's human nature to want to make other people around you happy with your efforts. And the problem in this job, or not problem, but the reality is that you never give anybody exactly what they want, ever. 
That is a huge point. And if you're listening to this and you're a product manager or leader, just take a moment to think about that and to feel a little better about yourself because everybody that's in a similar role to you will be feeling the same way. Yeah. And it's probably a wise thing for your own mental well being to come to terms with exactly what Tokes has just said. Yeah. And, and, and so, so, how do you feel good about a job that you're always disappointing people? And, it, and I, it, there's a lot of stuff that's connected here, right? Like, so you, you're sense of value and how you're projecting the value of the things you're doing needs to be a somewhat of a well this is why i did it this is why i didn't do exactly what you asked for and this is why i didn't do what you asked for at all um because what i'm trying to do is impact this thing over here and this is how we have decided we're going to approach it and even better if you can then demonstrate that with real analytics and data that support the value of the stuff you've done that nobody was actually asking you for they just wanted mm. you to do the thing right mm. because someone wanted to sell it or market it right mm. or not support it but you know there's value in everything there's still value in everything you do even if you don't do what anyone wants you to do is this tight is this tied into um, something else I've heard you talk about, which is the need to take emotion out of prioritization by having this strong story that is clearly able to articulate the why behind the decisions that were made and also the uh, what the approach was that was taken to deliver on that decision and, the, and then how we're going to measure it. Is, is that tied into that? I think so in that I, I can't remember ever saying, well, maybe I have. You've probably done some great research. I probably did say take the emotion out of it. But if you get too caught up in the, oh, I've got to please people, I've got to, oh, I feel like that might be the wrong decision. It's, it's very easy to be paralyzed by the decisions you're asked to make or to, mm. to influence. And so I think it's more important to make a decision than to make the best decision, right? Because you don't want to be trying to get it perfect, right? Because, the, you know, that's that's never going to work. And so I think you've got to find this balance between having data-driven. All the books tell you, well, you have a strategy, and the strategy will tell you what's important. Measure the opportunity. Is that opportunity worth more than another opportunity? Is A greater than B? Do A. <laughs> right? like, it's, which is kind of bullshit in, that, in its literal meaning. But it's aspirational, right? And mm. so because it's aspirational, you're, you're generally a, a fair way away from having this perfect, well, obviously this is the right thing to do. And mm. so most of the time, there's not an obvious clear winner in the candidates that have met the grade, right? So there's mm. lots of things that you can go, well, we're not going to work on the UK right now. We're going to work on New Zealand and Australia. That's just a big thing. But within New Zealand and Australia, there's probably quite a few th things. So you need to refine your thinking a little bit more. <clears throat> so it's it's better to have an opinion that's not 100% backed by science, but you've got a great story about it. You've mm -hmm. got a, a great hypothesis, and I, I could almost guarantee if you approach a piece of work that you're doing that is a bit of a punt, but you explain in your narrative and your explanation and all the things what your theory is, that'll, that'll solve most people's doubts. Hmm. they're not looking for a scientific equation that proves this thing's the best thing to do. What they're actually looking for is, have you thought about it enough? Have you given this enough consideration for us to believe that you believe that this is the right thing to do right now, given the vagaries of, of all the decision-making that's going on? And so, yes, that can be helped by Moscow, can be helped by all these frameworks, a rice score, or all these things, right? But they're really just tools to help you get a sense of what will ultimately be a – uh, a, a somewhat of a gut decision based off all that stuff that you've done in the past. It's not going to be A equals B, therefore C. It sounds like, Tokes, that you're saying that there's no perfect answer. No. Well, yeah, no, I mean, there's not, right? I mean, it's all shades of grey in this game. And I guess that's mm. why the, the sort of being in the middle of the, you know, managing disappointment is that you're never going to feel really good about nailing what somebody, if, you, if your satisfaction is coming from the acceptance of others, you're not going to be very happy in this job. Your satisfaction needs to be in the impact you create with the customers and how that aligns with what the business cares about rather than being a, you know, a people pleaser. Mm. I understand. Just be mindful of time. You have a boat to catch shortly. To so catch. I'm going to bring us down to the close. Thinking about what you've seen in your product career to date, 
What is the biggest challenge or opportunity that people and products face in New Zealand? The biggest opportunity that people face in New Zealand? Um, in New Zealand, I think the biggest challenge we have across the product space is that we don't have the right level of senior executive level leadership. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that it's very hard to influence the product culture within an organization because that needs to influence from the CEO right through to the, the graduate, right? And so if you're just a PM on a team within a machine, it's very hard for that to happen. And that, that pattern happens a lot. And I get that there's economic constraints around hiring a senior CPO as your first product hire. Uh, but I think if that's an option to have somebody who can be more senior than junior, I think that is a problem for businesses in general across New Zealand who are exploring how do they bring in product thinking into their organization. I think think a little bit higher, think a little bit longer term about how you want this practice to evolve over time. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing at, for a company thinking about product, for individuals thinking about product. I think the biggest challenge that they face is misreading the extent to which it's a leadership role. Mm -hmm. I, there's a lot of people I talk to who haven't yet worked out that and play the victim card a little bit too much. You can't be a victim to someone else in the business in this role. You've got to engage with that other part of the business, come to a, an agreement and buy into an, some approach, and then it's your decision. You, you're mm. not doing it because somebody told you to. That Leaders don't do that. Mm. Leaders lead, right, and they don't let you know all the stuff that's happened before. They just pre present a united front and so that you're not confused about who's leading what. And so that... So, so to that, to both those points, what I want to encourage people to think about when they're uh, thinking about product as a career is: don't think you have to come from technology or from the domain of the product, but I do think you have to come from leadership mm -hmm. or be have some natural inclination for leading and influencing others, because that is the thing that will stand you above the crowd and help you be successful uh, beyond any sort of scrum training or pm course or all, all the mechanics of the role can be learned mm. it's really hard to learn to be a leader and if mm. you've already proven that in marketing or in sales or in support or in any other or, or technology you might have become a leader through those ranks like i did um, that leadership quality is critical for anyone coming into this discipline mm, that's a great point to leave people with thank you this has been a wonderful conversation really appreciate you being so generous with sharing plenty of practical and hard-fought knowledge and insight and thank you also for your continued contribution to the new zealand product community thanks brendan and, and likewise thanks for the chance to to share some thoughts and have a good conversation i can uh, i can talk about this stuff forever so uh it was great thank you you're most welcome. I've learned a lot today, and I have no doubt that people listening will have also. Tokes, if people want to find out more about you and what you're up to, what is the best way for them to do that? Uh, I mean, I'm pretty old school. LinkedIn is the best way to ping me if you're, if you're in business and, and want to connect with me. Uh, you can find out what I do on andrewtokely.com. Uh, uh, the Twitter handle is still there, but I very rarely go into Twitter these days. So uh, it's good to see that the bio is still up there, though. <laughs> Thanks, Tokes. And to everyone that's tuned in, it's great to have you here too. Everything that we've covered in today's show will be in the show notes on YouTube, including where you can find Tokes plus all the resources that we've mentioned. If you enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in design, UX and product, don't forget to leave us a review and subscribe. And until next time, keep being brave. <laughs>